good to see you. Let's stand together as we worship Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. passage of scripture from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Let's stand together and I invite you to say this one with me as we worship together in the word. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. Now
Pray with me. Father, there are those very obvious reasons, not hard to spot at all, reason to say thank you. You've given us this day, and it's been a good day of worship and fellowship. You've allowed us to see you work, reminding us that you're still calling out those whom you are saving. You allowed us to celebrate baptism and enjoy that, that powerful picture of life change. You sent us rain, and we thank you for that. You have reminded us that you are the God of nature. And uh, we can expect certain things, we can anticipate certain things, and then you just throw us a little curveball, surprise us. We thank you for this day. Tonight, you've allowed us to gather together for worship, and I pray, Lord, that what you hear from us will be pleasing to you, that as we join together to praise you in all that we do, in song and in, in just a spoken word, uh, that you will be blessed tonight. In Christ's name we praise you. Amen.
didn't look back to see exactly when we began this. <clears throat> it's been a little while. We have been using Sunday nights, I have, to preach uh, through a collection of the Psalms. Not every one of them. That would have taken a few years. But uh, we come to the last of the Psalms tonight, to that 150th Psalm. And uh, it, I think it's an appropriate ending. I love Psalm 1, the beginning of the Psalter. It is a, a bit of a, uh, an introduction and a, uh, a summary of all that is going to come after it. And then you get to Psalm 150, and it is, it's a doxology. It is uh, an expression of praise. And, and I thought, well, that's a, a good place for us to wind up tonight. And, and I hope you've been thinking, uh, considering your assignment that I gave you a few moments ago, and, and you're prepared, uh, because the more prepared you are, the, the quicker this will go. The longer it takes you to think, we could be here a while. So just keep that in mind tonight as we get to that part of the service. Praise Him. In my limited experience, and it is, I've been in a number of churches. And every one of them had their own unique style of worship. No two were the same. And I haven't ventured out very much into some of the more liturgical traditions. I, I've not been very ecumenical in my worship because when I did go to other brands of church and I did worship with them, I came away saying, I'm glad I'm a Baptist. I, I was glad to have a, a, and when I say that, uh, a, a freer kind of worship, a more participatory kind of worship, one where we could express ourselves more, more openly, you know, more freely than those that were very rigid in their liturgy. That's not to say we don't have our liturgy. We do. If you've got an order, you've got a liturgy, and we follow that typically, and we're, we're very orchestrated. But every, every people has, has a way, their way that they're comfortable with, to praise the Lord. Uh, you, you have to be spiritually sterile to not be prompted to praise Him. You, you've got to be void of life not to have something within you that prompts you to want to praise Him. And so this Psalm 150 is that doxology. It is that encouragement. Let me read it in its entirety. You follow along. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, some of your translations may have a little different wording because in that first verse, in that last verse of that psalm, if we don't translate but merely transliterate, just bring the, 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 the word sound over into English from those earlier texts, that's where you get hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you are scared of saying that. You think it's some ancient mystical word that means something you're uncomfortable saying. Hallelujah means simply praise the Lord. So you can cut loose anytime you get ready. If praise the Lord is too many words for you, condense it to one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Of course, if you've got dentures, praise the Lord is probably easier than hallelujah. You may spit them out trying to get that one, trying to get that one out. I borrowed this arrangement from Derek Kidner in his commentary on the Psalms, and I, I liked these four parts of the Psalm as he pointed them out, beginning with uh, the, the where of praise. The call to praise is a call both to the heavens and to the earth to join together in praise to God. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse or in His, in His firmament. I have, I've, I've said to you frequently, and, and I, I do believe this, I, I think in, in spite of the way we've messed up the world, the way we've polluted the world, I still, still think there's an incredible beauty and splendor in God's creation. And I, I think it doesn't speak, you know, it, it doesn't talk, but you can't help but see God in the beauty of nature. This time of year, 
as the death of winter gives way to the life of spring, when all of those bare branches begin to leaf out with all of their hues of green, when, when all of that brownness gives way to an explosion of color, and all of those, of course, I realize some of you have spent a lot of time in your flower beds and you've got the aches and pains to prove it today. But, you know, God does a pretty good job all by himself. And, and all around our part of the world, in fact, out here on this little knoll here going out the driveway, there's an old house place. And, and you can still see some of those bulbs that are still coming up after all these years. And you can drive around and in pasture after pasture, you may see a, a chimney still standing. But around that chimney, there will be all those little yellow jonquils or whatever might have been planted by the previous tenants. And it's still there. And, and it hasn't been tended. It hasn't been fertilized. It hasn't been uh, taken care of by any of us. It's been taken care of by God. And, and you see in all of that, in all the colors, in all the beauty of nature, you see God's signature. And there is that, that desire just to, to acknowledge this is a praise to God. And we can thank him for what he's done. But the psalmist said, not only does the earth join with us in this, but the, the heavens and as well as all of us who are here in his sanctuary join together to praise him. I don't know how that works. I'm not going to be, c pretend to say that I do. But I, I do know this, that when Isaiah had the vision in Isaiah chapter 6, it was his call experience. In that vision, how, however that came to him, he, he saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. And he saw the six-winged seraphim around the throne. And as he observed them, he listened and they began to sing uh, hymn number one, Tim, I believe, Holy, Holy, Holy. Is that, is that? It was in the old hymnal. That's the one they use in heaven, I think. I, I think they, they, they opened it up and those seraphims sang together, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. I don't think it was a monotonous chant like the monks would do in the monkery. I think it was a glorious song together of the angels. And I, I don't know how, how the angelic chorus sounds. We're going to find out one day. We're going to find out one day because you're going to get to be a part of it. And, uh, and whether you could sing or enjoyed singing down here, you're going to get over that when you get to heaven. And I think we're all going to be caught up in, in that praise to God our Father. And, and I know we think of that as being out there, you know, somewhere in the future. But you realize in heaven there's no time. And what's going to be already is. God sees the past, the present, and the future all in one. So somehow or another, it all joins together in praise to him. And we get to be a part of that. We get to join together in, in, in lifting up our voices and in acknowledging who he is. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But there's, there is no inappropriate place to praise the Lord. Coming to church is a good place to do it, but there's no inappropriate place to praise the Lord. And, and you need to along the way, wherever you are out there. I know sometimes you're tempted to say other things, but you need to find reason wherever you are. Just say, thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that I belong to you. I'm grateful that you're my God. And so wherever we are under, under his expanse of heaven, wherever we are in his sanctuary, we can praise him. But the heart of the message, I believe, is the why of praise. And in that second verse, the psalmist called for praise for some very obvious reasons. This is not hard. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Well, what, what is that? What, does that what, is, what is made up of that, that time of praise? We praise him for what he has made. We've, we observe all that beauty and we need to say thank you over and over again. But we also praise him for what he has remade. Tim, uh, Bill, I, I want your, y'all come and get a microphone. I, I've given you an assignment and we, we don't do this a whole lot because I've stressed to you that I, I think the meat of our testimony ought not to be details in the ancient past. The meat of our testimony ought to be what God is doing in our lives today. But the reality is you haven't always been a believer. You haven't always been saved. Somewhere along the way, you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So these guys are ready. I know you feel like, well, everybody can hear me. I know you think you're loud, and in certain settings you are, but in here we can't hear you well. So if you'll just raise your hand, they're going to come to you. Remind me and us when and where you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just raise your hand. They're going to come as quickly. All right, here we go, Marla. When and where? I was seven years old 
and I was sitting at the dining room table with my mother and daddy, and I told them that I wanted to uh, be saved. They prayed with me, and then on Sunday, I went to church. Brother Haley was our preacher, and yeah. I walked the aisle and uh, have gone to church all my life. Amen. Amen. Good. Yeah. Good. Somebody else, throw your hand up. Here we go. Barbara Son, right here. Somebody else be ready. Bill, Bill and Tim can move in concert. All right, Miss Barb, go ahead. When? Where? Tell me about it. I was 31. It was in Lake Elsinore, California. And some rangers there had enticed me to come to church. I didn't want to go. And the first time I went, I hung onto the chair. I didn't even move. I was just wanted out. Yeah. Well, I went back the second week, and I ran. <laughs> it still makes me cry. <laughs> I ran down the aisle because no one had ever loved me like Jesus. Wow. No one. Yeah. And they never have. Yeah. And I've never looked back. I made my own mistakes, but I've never looked back. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? 31 years old. So you can get saved past the age of 10. Number two, in California of all places, <laughs> Barb Lasson met Jesus in California. He's everywhere. Baptist Church. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody else, raise your hand. Bill, you're over here. Don. I was eight years old. It was in a revival at uh, First Baptist Church, Pittsburgh, yeah. Texas. I think I was saved, you know, a week or two before that. I had awesome Sunday school teachers, and, and my parents certainly taught me about Jesus. But made the altar call, like Brother Larry Taylor. I remember his name. He was just an evangelist, you know, back yeah. in the day that came yeah. through. Yeah. But uh, he presented a message that tugged my heart, and I walked the aisle and been thankful ever since. Amen. Did you say eight years old? Yeah. Okay. Eight years old in Pittsburgh, Texas. Somebody else. Ethan? All right, you're back there. Dennis, go ahead. I was six years old and... Wow. Uh, saved at Gladewater Church. But then I was about 23 years old over at Ripley and Harold Emerson had the altar call. And for some reason I was standing there and I was almost shaken. I was hurting so bad I had to get up and go and I felt like I was having a heart attack. I broke out in a sweat and I had to get to the front of that altar. And I think at that time, God really took hold of my life. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Ethan, you ready? When and where? At my house. Okay. I was five years old. Okay. I was in my mom's room. Okay. Um, I wanted to be a Christian. Yeah. So... Cool. I prayed. Amen. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody else. All right. Here in the middle aisle, Liz and Bonnie. I was 13. All right. Um, attending a Lutheran church in Minnesota because that's what we had. Um, I had to go to catechism classes every Saturday because everybody joined the church when they were 16. Wow. But you had to go two years to catechism classes. I got very upset one Saturday because the kids were just messing around with the whole thing, and it was serious to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I caught my teacher afterward, and I said, I will never be able to go to heaven because I will never understand all of this. Mm. It's just beyond me. I'm working at it, but it's just beyond me. And he sent me to Romans. And in my home, in my bedroom, Jesus met me. Amen. Amen. Apart from catechism. Yeah. Liz? All right. I was nine years old, and it was in Mineola at First Baptist Church, and James Robinson was holding a revival. Really? James Robinson revival slash crusade. How about that? He was... He was pretty popular in this part of the world back in that day. Billy, what you got? Tell me about it. Well, I was in the neighborhood of, <laughs> scared you, didn't I? Five years old at the Talco Baptist Church yes, where sir. I'd been raised up. Yes, there, sir. At, at Talco. 
And uh, the preacher was preaching about breaking the chains of the devil. Hmm. And I, I, can, I can't remember anything else at five years old, but I can remember that day just like it was yesterday. Yes. And at the, at the end of the pew was my daddy and then sat my mother and then, then I was there. Well, I got up. And as I went by, mother reached to grab me. And I gave her the shoulder roll at that time. She wasn't fast enough, and I broke out in the aisle. And I approached the pastor, and he looked down at me, and I looked way up at him because he was tall. And uh, I told him, I said, I won't accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And that was my day that I accepted the Lord. By, Amen. In the neighborhood of five years old. Amen. Amen. Good. Somebody else? Somebody else? Miss Sammy Hazel, who, by the way, has got a birthday this week. It's going to be 93 years old. Bill's coming around the corner. Here he is. I was born between Gary, Texas and Timpson, Texas, in a dog trot house. <laughs> and the closest church was a Pentecostal church. Yes. And my mother and I walked there. I was three or four. And I really, I've always believed I was saved at that time, but I didn't know how to express it to anyone. And so when we moved to Houston, then I walked to the little church down at the corner and had wonderful uh, Sunday school teachers, Ms. Brown and Ms. Miles. <laughs> and when I was nine years old, I was old enough to really express it and brother paul brumlow was my pastor and two years later my mother and my brother were saved wow wow and then my you know my son was 60 years old when he was saved eight years ago yes ma'am so. yes ma'am who praise the lord praise the lord all right somebody else all right tim back in the back billy ann is that you yes um I was saved at a revival in Cookytown, Oklahoma at my church. Um, and I was scared to death. I kept saying, no, no, no. It was one of those two week revivals and every night I was saying, no, no. And I go home and my stomach was upset because I didn't do what I should do. Yeah. Finally I did it. And when you are, uh, and then I was baptized there, but uh, when you became a um, believer then, you started serving somewhere in the church. And I've been serving ever since I was nine years old. Amen. All right. Good. Miss Joyce? I was four years old, and I was, we were in the, my mother's bedroom, and she was sitting on the side of the bed, and I was standing in between her legs and asking her all kinds of questions about Jesus. And she was explaining to me, and Jesus appeared to me just through the window. I said, well, there he is. And she couldn't see him, but I could. And that's the, the last time I remember any time, anything about being saved. Yeah. And I just believe he's guided my life the whole, whole time. Yes, ma'am. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. Miss Ruthie? Uh, this is a little bit different because I was raised with a, a family. My dad was a minister and he was an evangelist. And we went through several years of camp meetings and revivals. And um, of course, you know, when somebody goes to the altar, everybody's got to go to the altar, you know. But um, I can remember that when I was home, uh, I was probably about 10 or 11, and uh, <clears throat> I was reading my Bible. For some reason, I was reading my Bible at that time, and I felt the Holy Spirit come to me. Yeah. And uh, I accepted Jesus right in my bedroom. So, grateful for parents. Amen that um, ministered to me, and I've been, been grateful ever since. Amen. 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 Good. Good. All right, we're going to wind this up, but before we do, 
Uh, Bill, you and Tim have microphones. Take your turn. Bill, go first. Well, my dad was a, was a pastor, and uh, we were living in Catonsville, just outside of Baltimore. And my dad always, I noticed that dad always gave tracts to people, and uh, those little folded up brochures that told mm -hmm. people about Christ. I saw an opportunity to make a little bit of money because he would stamp the back of the track with his name, the church name, and telephone number. So I set up a little shop there in the living room and I was stamping tracks, probably 25 for a nickel or something, <laughs> making big bucks. And um, just got to talking to him about that. And I uh, just really felt convicted. As a little boy, I just, I was a little mischievous. And um, I know it's, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I just felt dirty inside and I didn't have a peace. And uh, in my living room there, I prayed to receive Christ with my dad. And just immediately, I felt clean, and Amen. I felt a peace. Amen. And it was uh, the next week or so, there was a revival. The evangelist was Hyman Appleman. Wow. A Jewish wow. convert, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I made my profession of faith during the revival when he was preaching. Years later, I found out that my grandparents here in Texas had made their profession of faith when a Jewish evangelist named Hyman Appleman was preaching. Yeah. Amen. That was cool. Amen. Come on down, fine. Uh, I, was, I was 11 years old. Yeah. Uh, Bethel Baptist Church, Jody Atkinson was our pastor. We were in week one of a two-week revival Friday night. I don't remember the evangelist's name, but Francis LaRock was our worship, was, who led the music. Yep. And uh, I felt the Lord tugging at my heart and sitting on the back row with all the other prepubescent boys in the back of the church. Uh, God led me, called me. Yeah. And I've saved, uh, baptized at Bethel Baptist Church. Amen. 11 Amen. years old. Come on down and hand the microphone to Richard. He's going to be next, whether he knows it or not. Patrick, you're next. All right. Well, I was, uh, I was 18. Uh, I had gone off to college at Angelo State uh, University, and uh, I had met somebody basically first day that I went to school, and they invited me to church, and I went with them for about three weeks, and, you know, I kind of thought I needed to get baptized at the time because I hadn't, I had never done that. And I put it off for several weeks and talking to somebody about it. Finally, three weeks later, I have a conversation with the college pastor and he shares the gospel with me. And um, I realized I had never actually heard the gospel before. And just one night I was in my, uh, my dorm room and I gave my life to Jesus knowing, uh, Know what he did to give us salvation, and um, and then I got to talk to him several weeks after about being baptized, knowing Christ had already saved me, rather than getting baptized to make myself saved. So, yeah. Amen, Amen. Richard, I was seven years old and at home, and when my mom came in to my room, and we just were talking and. Um, I prayed then as she told me about Christ and what he did for me, and I prayed right then to receive him. Amen. So. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank all of you. Um, I had turned seven in the fall, and this was in the spring in April of that year, that next year, and uh, grew up thankful for a mom and dad who, who showed me Christ, talked about Christ, and, and led me to that. But because of our connection with the church, they were always good friends with our pastor. And they were with Brother Mott. And so on this particular Wednesday night, after I talked to mom and dad, uh, they suggested that while they were having choir practice, Brother Mott and I would talk in his office. And it was a Spartan little office at Calvary Baptist Church in Cullen, Louisiana. And I, I went in and I sat and talked to this ancient, ancient old preacher who I felt like had to be near the end circling the drain. He was 66 years old. <laughs> but that's perspective. But he was a friend, a friend of my mom and my dad. And, and as a result, he was my friend. And he treated me like one of his own grand, grandkids and affirmed what my mother and dad had shared with me. And, and I, I asked Christ to do what Christ could do. Nothing I could do, it was all him. And, uh, and he saved me, gloriously saved me, and, and began a work that I'm grateful continues to this day. 
And, and that's, that's the beauty of salvation. I mean, we, we can say, I got saved. We can say that, and it's true. But because we got saved, we are still being saved. And God is still at work in our lives. And, and one day, one day, the end is going to come. We sang about that this morning. Uh, tonight, 10,000 Reasons. Uh, one day, the end is going to draw near, and we're going to stand before him face to face. And on that day, we get to trade in an old, worn-out body and get a brand new body. And we're going to be gloriously saved in that moment. And we can just praise the Lord for that and thank him for that. We have so much for which to give him thanks. And, and so that's, that's part of our, our story, part of what we can tell. We can share with anybody and everybody, I was here and this is what God did. And what you heard tonight is that there is no one rubber stamp way to come to Christ. He meets us where we are. He knows when we are prepared. You, you can be aghast at the age of some and others, but I'm telling you, God knows our hearts and he knows when we're ready. And, and there are some very young children who are ready to make that commitment. And there are others that aren't ready for a long way down the road. But God knows and he is after us. He seeks us and, and wants us to be his children. And I thank you for your testimonies tonight. And there's another aspect of that praise that I think the psalm is pointed to praise him for his mighty deeds. We've talked about that, but praise him according to his excellent greatness. And y'all, I think that it is important that we, we just remember all of those names that God has been tagged with, Old Testament and New Testament, and, and those names particularly were associated with the activity of God. So when the psalmist prompts us to praise him according to his excellent greatness, we know that helps us better understand why in the Old Testament, when an event would occur, they would, they would praise God in a particular way. He is Jehovah Jireh. You might have seen that name. And that sounds like a mystical name. But you know what that means? He is the God who provides. He shows up at just the right time and he takes care of our needs. And so they exalted him as Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Shalom. He is God, our peace because in times of turmoil, in times of trouble, God shows up and gives us his peace. He is Jehovah Nisi, God, our banner. His banner over us is our salvation and is his love. He is Jehovah Rapha, God, our healer, who comes to us in our times of brokenness and is able to heal our bodies and our spirits. I, I like this one, and, and this was one that I hadn't thought about for a long time. Jehovah Roe, the God who sees us. He is Jehovah Ra, the God who shepherds me, the good shepherd. And then you move into the New Testament and he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the bread of life. And that's the beauty of the Gospel of John. Every time God, John gives us the details of one of Jesus' miracles or signs, as he called them, there is a discourse that follows that. So there's an object lesson, a miracle, and then there's a revelation of the character of God as Jesus taught his disciples. And he tells us about how God acts and how God provides for us. And one of those was the bread of life. One of those was the good shepherd. When he talked about the Holy Spirit, we call out to him as our comforter. When we acknowledge who Jesus is, we acknowledge that he is our savior and that he is our redeemer and we could keep on going. And so when we pray and when we worship and when we praise him, we can call out any and every name of God that we can remember that reminds us of his activity, of his deeds of greatness in our life. Well, let's move on to point number three. I, I know what time it is. The how of praise. The psalmist gave instructions as to how that praise was to transpire. Praise him with trumpet sound. Tim, there you are. It's right there in the book, Psalm 150. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel. And this is going to make us Baptists very nervous. And dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Perhaps, perhaps this was reminiscent of the time when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. You back up to 2 Samuel chapter 6 and there. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. It was a raucous time of celebratory praise. I thought about this, and, and this is just an aside, a parenthetical insertion in my sermon. You might remember that David led the procession as they were bringing 
the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And apparently, in some fashion, David was getting down with his bad self. He was enjoying the praise. He was dancing around a bit. And his dour wife, Michael. Now, I, I always wanted to believe that Michael was kind of with it, you know, a, a pretty attractive, supportive wife. But she was up in the window watching her husband dance and praise. And she got on him that night when he got home. She dressed him down, criticizing his behavior and, and how he was not being appropriate as the king. Now, this is a warning to some of you who are uptight and stuck in your rut. She criticized the king for his praise. The scripture says in the immediately following verses, as a result of that, she never bore children. Was there a connection? I believe so. She was so uptight, God just said, that's it, sister. So, it is not a good thing. You may not be comfortable with, with some, some music, you know. I, I mean, we've come a long way from uh, piano and organ back in the day, Deanna, you were right there. We, we've added a lot of instruments. We had them up here tonight. Our, our music has changed. It's evolved over the years. We sing some songs that are familiar old hymns. We sing new songs. Some are upbeat, some are slower. We, we have a great variety and, and we don't scratch the surface to the way some churches in other places worship. In, in fact, if, if we could gather up a big bunch of us and go to Africa and join some of our brothers and sisters in Christ worshiping in that African setting. Some of you would have a coronary occlusion on the spot. We would have to bury you right there because you would be overcome with the fact that these folk are really enjoying the Lord. And our worship ought to be our praise, our enjoyment of the Lord. And, and the, I think the summary statement that we could make, how, how do we praise the Lord? You use everything you've got. Everything you've got. Now, here's the qualifier. Any kind of response in worship, any kind of use of a musical instrument, any kind of singing must always be focused on the Lord. It should never draw attention to an individual. It should never distract people away from the Lord. And, and that's why yeah, there are some things we're not going to do. There are some styles we're not going to employ. There are some songs we're never going to sing because they're not written. They're not prepared. They're not designed to point people to Christ. They're designed, written, and employed to point people to a performer. It becomes a performance. Worship is not a performance for us. It's a performance for the Lord, exalting Him and praising Him. And so we'll, we'll use whatever, whatever we've got. Now, heretofore, and I'm kind of grateful for that, nobody showed up with a sanctified accordion. Uh, we've not had, we did have a sister at Penile Baptist Church in West Monroe. We'd have fifth Sunday night hymn sing, which by the way, those can be a curse as well as a blessing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to call her name because some of her family may be in the room and that would just be my luck. But, but she played an auto harp and, and uh, she wrote her own songs. And she'd always tell dad as fifth Sunday night was coming, she'd, she'd approach him. She had kind of a, a deep <clears throat> voice. Brother Charles, God gave me another song last night. I'm going to sing it fifth Sunday. I was a teenager. Teenagers are bad, okay? And, and so every time daddy would come home and he would say to mother, Henry, Jan's, oh, I wasn't going to tell you. She's written, she's written another song and we're going to get to hear it next, next Sunday night. Well, it was like, us four kids would roll our eyes and go, oh, no. And she'd mount up on the platform. We, we, it wasn't as high as this one, but they'd pull her chair out. And, and, and she, I mean, when you play the auto harp in your lap, you ought to wear a long skirt. <laughs> well, she didn't. Thank God she had those industrial strength 3M support hose that were opaque. But anyway... She would get all spraddled out and she would mount that auto harp and she'd start strumming that thing. And, and she'd strum a while till she found her first note and then she'd cut loose. And oh my Lord, it made some country music look theologically inspired. It was some of the worst stuff you've ever heard in your life. So perhaps we should have filtered a little better. I don't know. There ought to be limits, but it ought always to point people to the Lord and exalt him. And then the who. 
Final question is asked and answered in verse 6. Let everything, everything and everybody that has breath praise the Lord. And then that final word, praise the Lord, are hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, we must be, I think if we are spiritually healthy, we must be a people of praise and adoration. And allow that to get into us and us to get into it as we exalt the Savior, worshiping together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's been good tonight. I thank you for the testimonies that we've heard. I thank you for the spirit of worship. I thank you for the song that Crystal and Rose shared with us a few minutes ago. And Father, I pray that we will be that people of praise. We will be that group that exalt you, and that we wouldn't allow, any, allow anybody or anything to stanch that flow of of praise and adoration. We wouldn't let any circumstance keep us, Father, from being able to offer to you our praise. We thank you tonight and pray that in this invitation, as we wait before you, that you will draw us even closer to yourself. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.